This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay. The first question today is, what is the symbolism of water in the Bible relative to other religions like Islam, Buddhism? Are there any special properties to water? Uh, does water have any magical or miraculous qualities? Why does the Bible talk so much about water? Well, good question. In uh, Greek philosophy, water is believed to be the foundation elementary um, element of, from which all things are derived. And with that, the Bible appears to agree. Second Peter 3, verses 5 through 6, in the New American Standard 95 edition, as always, it says, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And then, of course, we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So the Bible puts water in that, uh, in that position that things are formed on, uh, on the element of water. The Koran seems to state the same thing because it says, quote, from water we have made all things, end of quote. As I understand it, uh, in the Koran, water plays an elementary part in Islam, which should not be too surprising to us because, as you've heard me state on this program in the past, uh, Islam is really uh, the... Arab attempt to answer Christianity and Judaism. It was uh, it began 600 years after uh, the birth of Christ, and uh, it's apparent that Muhammad had a great deal of contact with both Jews and Christians, people he called people of the book, and therefore you would expect to see a lot of similarity with some of those concepts. As far as Buddha is concerned. In, in the research that I've done, it does not appear to me that water plays uh, any significant part in the concepts of Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism uh, seems to center and emphasize on the mental aspect of what is known as world enlightenment, and physical things are really not considered to be all that important. In fact, attachment to anything physical in Buddhism is considered to be a weakness. Now, in Hinduism, there is a little different viewpoint. The Ganges River in India is considered to be sacred. In fact, water is a sacred element in Hinduism, and, uh, and it, it doesn't end in Hinduism. In many of the polytheistic religions there, yeah, it seems to be a great deal of emphasis on water. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why I think in the Bible there is a lot of emphasis on water and uh, its properties when we come back right after you look at this. In the Bible, water is an especially appropriate symbol of, of a number of good things because Water is very scarce in the Bible lands. Those of us who live here in Arizona uh, like water, don't we? It's uh, living in the desert and even up here in Prescott in the mountains. We're living in an, in an arid region. And uh, when we've gone through a period of drought, as we have uh, in the last 10 years, off and on drought periods, water is very much appreciated and um, very, it's a very valuable 
commodity. I can hardly think of a drier, more arid place in the world than, than Palestine, unless it would be some of the deserts in Africa. In Palestine, the main source of water is rainfall. And the, the rainfall, of course, is, uh, comes from the Mediterranean Sea. The evaporation from the Mediterranean Sea forms clouds and carries those clouds uh, to the mountains in the region of Palestine, and there it falls in the form of rain and, and snow on those mountains. The rivers there in Palestine in the Bible lands are mostly small areas and uh, small rivers, and they're seasonal rivers. Um, very often they're dry in the warmer months without much water at all. For the most part, springs provide water to villages, and, uh, and sometimes, and in fact, I understand that most of the time the springs are are not sufficient. So water is gathered together in cisterns and stored for, uh, for long term to, to provide the needs in, uh, of the people there. Most of the water, I understand, in, in the Bible lands falls on the western slopes in the mountains. And because the, uh, much of the land in Palestine is limestone, it, it doesn't hold water well. So there are not a lot of wells there. There are pools like the Pool of Bethsaida and mentioned in Genesis 21 and, and Isaac's well in Genesis chapter four, uh, 24, Jacob's well in John chapter 4, the Pool of Salome in uh, John chapter 9, others, but relatively few wells. So uh, water was a and is, and is to most people in the world, a, a very precious commodity. Washing with water was required under the Old Testament law for Levitical priests. In fact, it, it held a very significant place in the temple ceremony. You can read about this if you're inclined to do so in Leviticus chapter 11, chapter 16, chapter 17, Numbers chapter 19, Exodus chapter 30. Sacrifices under the Old Testament law were to be washed, Exodus 29 verse 4 and Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 9. In the New Testament, water symbolizes a number of things. For example, uh, read with me John 3 and verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In this place, Jesus is emphasizing the significance of baptism by immersion in water. By being baptized by immersion, symbolically, we go through a death and a burial and a resurrection by which one becomes a child of God. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 tells us, When we are baptized by immersion in water for the forgiveness of our sins, our sins are washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16 says. And that's the place at which the Christian receives the gift, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 and verse 38 tells us. Furthermore, that action unites us with Christ, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4 says, and we're in that action added to his kingdom, which is his church. Acts 2, 47 says, Colossians 1, 16 tells us, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. So there's a great deal of important symbolism in in that act. Jesus further teaches in John 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Jumping down to verse 13, 
Jesus says, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. You see, this water, which symbolized eternal life, was the word of God, which Jesus taught to the woman at the well. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 says, So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Here Paul is talking about the church of Christ. Those who are washed, he says, and cleansed in the water with the word. The word of God is pure. It is that for which Christians thirst. And the Hebrew writer says, Hebrews 10 and verse 22, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here again, we have a reference back to the symbolism involved in baptism. It's the immersion in water which washes away our sins. In the book of Acts, there are a number of references to water and to baptism. Acts 8 and verse 36 says, As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And jumping down just a couple of verses into verse 38, And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. In this place, we learn that when one is taught about Jesus from the Bible, through, through this teaching, one is taught about the necessity of baptism by immersion in water and its relationship to salvation. You see, if the old concept that was developed uh, several hundred years ago was true, that sprinkling with water was just as uh, fit a symbol as immersion in water, then uh, we would not have this story where Philip orders the chariot to stop at a large body of water and they both go down into the water. With this, we have total agreement with the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, God has chosen water as a symbol for salvation for the Christian. The Apostle John used water in a number of ways in his writings. 1 John 5 and verse 6, he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. And then in John, 1 John 5 and verse 8, John says, The Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Here we have... Uh, uh, I think, a, a reference to, to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. We have the Spirit and the water and the blood. 
Revelation 7 and verse 17. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And one more Revelation passage. Revelation 22 and verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So for the Christian, water can symbolize many things. It can symbolize God's care and concern, God's provision, God's word, God's salvation. And uh, while there are no mystical or magical powers in water, it, it stands as a symbol for a number of things. Um, the very fact is, the facts of nature are these. Without water, you die. I think you can go uh, three or four days without water before you die. Now, there have been some who have gone as long as a week or, or so without water and who survived, but they usually had very s severe health consequences later, and some of them later died. So uh, most physicians tell us, and those who know these things say, that if you, if you go without water for three or four days, you're, you're dead. And uh, certainly it takes less time than that in the Arizona heat. So for water in the Bible to be a symbol of eternal life and salvation, it's, it's very apropos. It's very fitting. So there it is. Um, I hope that helps to answer your question. And we'll look at another one of your questions when we come back in just a minute. Okay, I'm going to start looking at this question. It's obvious if you're paying attention to your clock that I'm not going to get through this. Well, maybe it's not so obvious. Here's the, here's the question. Mike, have you heard about the Hallelujah Diet? They say that you can eat the way God intended and live very long lives. They quote from Genesis 1.29. Can you look at this? Well, let's look at Genesis 1.29 real quickly, which says, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, and which is the fruit of a, of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat or food. Well, what the Hallelujah Diet says is, as I started to quote, you have everything you need for true physical nourishment and great health from our provider in Genesis 129. They say, then, that the great ages attributed to the patriarchs in Genesis, and they come up with a number, I think they... they say the average age was 912 years old. And the reason they lived 912 years is because they only ate, they only ate the things that you read in Genesis 129. Everything else that man eats today, including bread, is bad for you. It'll kill you. That's why you're dying at 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. You could live till you're 900 years old if you just eat what Genesis 129 says. That's the hallelujah diet in, in uh, capsule. So um, we'll talk about that next week. My question is why, um, could I ask you this? Why do you want to live 900 years anyway? Um, could I ask you that? Would that be all right? And uh, we'll examine this in detail when we come back together next week. Don't forget about the family encampment at Copper Basin, July 30th through August 2nd, 2005. We would love to see you there. Please come up and be with us. John W. Smith, the author of many books, will be there. He'll sign your books. And if you come up, um, we will greet you and encourage you. And um, I know that you will be blessed by attending the family in camera. Bring your family and your friends. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.
We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.